The magistrate ruled in his favor. This was Lincoln's first law case, and he won it. In the fall of 1828, when Abraham was 19 years old, the local storekeeper and trader, James Gentry, engaged the young woodsman to help his son, Alan, build a flatboat for a trading voyage down the Ohio and the Mississippi to New Orleans. About the middle of December, 1828, Lincoln and Alan Gentry shoved off with their cargo of beans, cornmeal, grain, chickens, cured meats, beeswax, mostly local produce that Gentry had taken in trade. Broad of back and long and strong of limb, Lincoln handled the heavy bow oar and kept the cumbersome craft clear of snags and sandbars, kept her in the channel out of the dangerous eddies. As they floated downstream, the wealth and greatness of America flowed with the corner. At first, the stretch of river was unbroken, longer. Then around the sweep of the river, they would come upon a great plantation. As they peddled their goods at the dock, Lincoln called his first glimpse of the opulent plantation life and slavery. Slaves were everywhere, for wealth depended upon slavery. Thirty years later, what Abraham saw then must have been the end of his memory. He said, I am naturally a human of slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I will not remember when I didn't think so. The end of their journey was war. A thousand miles down the road. Here Lincoln saw in one place of one mind, brought him to the vast powers of a nation endowed with nature's wealth. The sights and sounds of this, his first big city, were strange to the night young woodsman, but he took it all in. He took home $24 for his three months' work. He gave this to his father, according to the custom. Studious, searching, always learning. This was young Abraham but with all of it, he was still a boy, growing up in a place that still was wild. And when the times were right, the horseplay and the roast meat in combat that were a natural part of growing up were a part of Lincoln's life. He never picked a fight and never passed one. He faced a fight with William Grigsby over the ownership of a sloppy tongue. Lincoln was not willing to fight the smaller Grigsby and appointed his stepbrother John Johnston to fight in his place. When Grigsby shellacked the young Johnston, Abe strolled into the arena, picked up Grigsby and tossed him out of the ring. Then he invited one and all to come on and fight. A glorious free-for-all result. Abraham's great height, his long legs, his great muscular development made him a champion in most athletic events. The center of the community socialized his church. Plans for a meeting house were formed in the midst of a little Dixon Baptist church on March 10, 1821. Thomas Lincoln contributed his carpentry skills to the building on a spot one half mile from here. Abraham Lincoln was sexton in his church, and years later, in the law, a notebook was found in which was recorded supplies ordered by A. Lincoln, sexton. Religious feeling burned fiercely in these pioneers, and the fire was fanned briskly by the attendant preachers, which he great heights of religious oratory condemned. 
dance. The bong and dance is a wedding where much enlivened by fiddling and spirits distilled in the neighborhood. Then in 1826, Sarah Lincoln married Aaron Rigsby. Two years later, Sarah died and was buried in the cemetery next to Little Pigeon Baptist Church. This was the second tragedy for Abraham Lincoln in the end. When the Lincolns pushed on to Illinois in 1830, Abraham went with him. A man of 21 now, and soon to strike out on his own. In Indiana, in this place, he spent 14 years, exactly one quarter of what was to be his life span. These were the years. This was the place of his youth. Of them he said, here I grew up. I have the roots of greatness. Here, in the single life of this place, greatness was nurtured. The Lincoln in our memory is a man who knew and loved people. In this was the mark of his greatness. In this was the measure of his suffering. Surely of all men, Lincoln himself knew the truth of his own words. When in his first inaugural address, he said, I appeal to the mystic chord of memory, 